It was Pro Day on Friday at Chestnut Hill, and we're going to talk with Mitch Wolf about the over dozen Boston College players that attempted to find their path to the NFL. Hear his thoughts on whose draft stock improved and who didn't move very much. All of this and more on today's Locked On Boston College. You are Locked On Boston College, your daily podcast on the Boston College Eagles, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Locked On Boston College. I am your host, AJ Black. I hope you had a great weekend. I had a busy weekend of watching lots of college basketball uh, for a weekend that I didn't expect much from the ACC to even show up in. We now have two ACC teams in the Final Four, but I'm not here to talk about basketball. I'm here to talk about the Pro Day. With me, I have BC Bolton um, writer Mitch Wolf. Mitch, how's it going? Doing good. Uh, just got finished watching St. Peter's uh, run come to an end, getting absolutely drubbed by North Carolina, which was very sad. But like you said, good for the conference to be well represented in the final four. Yep. Uh, one of our co-hosts from the reg- from the uh, football season, Eric Hostis, was r- r- ripping on me at the beginning of the tournament for saying that the ACC had turned it around. Um, he uh, eventually offered an apology, but I'm, I'm not ready to take that yet. So <laughs> anyways. Pro Day, the big event at Chestnut Hill happened on Friday, and it had over a dozen Boston College football players and one Boston College baseball player, Dante Baldelli, the brother of Rocco Baldelli, the Minnesota Twins manager. Weird age difference there. They're about 20 years apart, it seems like. Um, But I had to actually look to see if he was his son at one point. Um, (laughs) Just to know. Um, But it was a big event and there were, I think scouts from almost every team in the NFL. There was USFL, XFL scouts, all, CFL. Everyone was there watching a bunch of BC players do a bunch of drills. So Mitch, what were some of your takeaways? Uh, you know, what did you, what did you notice? I know you watched a lot of it on the ACC network. What did you, what did you, what did you see? I think the biggest takeaway was that the um, guys we expect to get drafted didn't really do anything or at least didn't participate in the athletic testing drills. And that's obviously Zion Johnson and Alec Lindstrom. They stood on their combine numbers and just worked out in the positional drills. And they didn't show a ton of that on the broadcast because most people don't really know what they're looking at. So they, you know, spliced it in with interviews with the players and stuff like that, you know, some fluff stuff. So, you know, and that's fine. It is what it is. Uh, but you expect those guys to do well in those drills They're not wearing pads, not the, uh, the be all end all, but you know, it's nice to see them getting able, being able to work out in front of NFL personnel all the same. Yeah. And so Zion, let's talk about him for a moment. You know, has, has anything changed or is he still going to be a mid-level first round draft pick? Yeah. I, I expect to see him go in the first round um, just because he's had a really good draft process, you know, starting from the senior bowl and the combine and, you know, not much change with this pro day, but I imagine that he's been interviewing with a lot of teams going on visits and I can't imagine those aren't, aren't going poorly. You know, I would imagine he's doing quite well there because he's, you know, a very eloquent player. You know, he's, he uh, is obviously very smart, you know, getting his master's degree in cybersecurity governance and policy, which is uh, pretty impressive. And, you know, I think as teams look at him, they're going to see a guy that is ready to be an NFL starter day one and be a successful one. And at the end of the day, that's what teams are looking for in the first round. They want guys that are going to be immediate impact starters. And I think that's exactly what Zion Johnson can be. I think we talked about it last week. I saw a few more mock drafts to have him go to the Patriots. And I get a little excited every time because then I want to root for him as a fan and I'm a Pats fan. So I can do that. Um, and that, that'll give me a chance. But I, I don't know. Um, so Alec Lindstrom. Now, Alec Lindstrom um, is projected still to be about a, the second or third center to go. And, you know, it was a, it, as you said, he didn't do much in terms of any of the events. He just did his positional drills. Did you notice anything when you watched that or is that kind not, of stuff? Not particularly. It's just because you see guys, you know, running around in shorts and t-shirts hitting bags. So yep. I think for the more trained eyes of NFL coaches and such, they can, you know, see that especially when you're doing it up close you can see and you can feel you know how hard the guys are hitting how fast they're moving um you know it's a little hard with camera angles and all that but 
for Alec, I, I expect him to be a day three pick because um, he had, he had a really good uh, combine in terms of showing his athletic ability. The problem is just based on his size being six, three under 200 pounds, he got up to 299 for the pro day, which is good to see. Um, I imagine that he's putting on weight, ideally muscle and getting stronger, but in my eyes, he's pretty scheme specific. He'll have to go to a team that employs his own blocking running scheme. Luckily, that is the majority of NFL teams these days. Yep. Um, and so I see him more as a long-term backup at this point. Um, you know, if he has to come in and play a few snaps for an injury that he should be okay. But I see him as being a backup, a guy that, you know, is more valuable in practice than is ne- necessarily on game day, just because, you know, he, again, is a really smart player. He has NFL bloodlines and, you know, if you've seen any of his interviews or his content, you know, he's kind of a, he's just a personality guy. Like he's going to be a glue guy in the locker room. I'm sure his teammates are going to love him and teams will value that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He's, he's, as I've said it for years, one of my favorite people to listen to, to talk. And that's obviously why he's, you know, BC kind of, uh, kind of laid into that a little bit with giving him a podcast and his own YouTube show and all that stuff, because he, he is a really funny guy and he has a lot to talk about. Um, as I've said of any of these players that BC's had over the last few years, I would imagine when Alec Lindstrom's days are done playing football, he'll be in the, he'll be a media guy. Um, you know, either like having his own sports show or something like that. Cause I, yeah, he's, he's destined to be the next Cole Kubelik or Mike Golick Jr. Or one of those guys that, you know, is kind of in and around ESPN doing uh, content that's, you know, you're it's sports centric, but it's a little more, you know, interesting and exciting with yeah, the kind of add on stuff they do. I was going to say like, there's around here, a bunch of former NFL linemen, but they are, they're all in like the W E E I's, but they're all like kind of nasty about sports. <laughs> like, you know, Fred Smurlis is a BC alumni and he, all he did when I used to listen to sports radio around here was rip BC. And I was like, um, <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I like Allie. Now what, what, before we get to our uh, second segment, Let's just let's stick to the offense for a little bit. Were any anything that you noticed or anything that you thought, oh, that really hurt them or kind of stuck stood out for you on the for any of the prospects on the offense? I thought Travis Levy had a decent day. His 40 yard dash wasn't that great um, at only a four point six nine. That's not really good for a running back, but his jumps were solid and. You know, he's another guy where he kind of, he will do anything like he's going to be on special teams. He's going to run down kicks. He's going to block for kicks. He can catch the ball back. He can block. He can run like he can do everything. So I'm not sure he's going to be able to stick on an NFL roster for a long time. But, you know, if he maybe he sticks on a practice squad for the first season just because he is, you know, one of those every do everything glue guys that, um, you know, is valuable just because he can fill a lot of roles, you know, do stuff on scout teams. So that's least valuable. Um the other guys I didn't think were that great. You know, Trey Barry had great measurements getting up to 250 pounds at six, six with an 85 inch wingspan. So that's nice, but his 40 dropped to 4.9, which is pretty slow for a guy that big. And his jumps were not very good. Only a 25 and a half inch vertical and a nine foot broad jump. Um, and then Tyler Rabel and Ben Petrula had okay days, you know, they for linemen, there isn't that much to do with uh, athletic testing, but So they were solid, but for the offense, I would say that's kind of my summary of that side of the ball. All right. So in a moment, Mitch and I are going to talk about the defensive side. And then we're going to talk about Boston College's offensive line coach, which has become the Twitter um, topic du jour as he's put together some uh, great tweets. And we're going to start our own weekly segment that you're not going to want to miss. So check that out in just a moment. I love and hate close games in college basketball during March Madness. The drama, but oh, the pain when you're on the other side of it. That's what happened this week with St. Peter's and Purdue. I know St. Peter's just lost yesterday, but man, that Purdue game killed my bracket. I needed Purdue to win, and they didn't, and that killed it. Now, Sat Heroes NCAA single game pickums pits the star players against each other in an amazing hybrid between fantasy and sports gambling. Take control back from those handicappers that always seem to have the advantage. Start focusing on the players you know with best with a gameplay that doesn't rely on big spreads, long odds, or funky props. Sat Hero gives you the advantage, resulting in their gamers winning four times more often. Why? Because Stat Hero eliminates the mystery about who or what you're going up against. Now check them out. They have a simple sleek gameplay that will have you playing in minutes. They simply post players for you to take on with the set of players you choose. It's easy and it's the fastest way to get your sports action fix. This is what daily fantasy was meant to be. So head on over to stathero.com slash locked on and use promo code locked on for 100% deposit match. 
That's sathero.com slash locked on. And use promo code locked on for 100% match. Sathero.com slash locked on, promo code locked on. Term and conditions do apply. This is Locked On Boston College. AJ Black here. For all of you who have listened for the over the last couple of weeks, if you are a regular listener, thank you all who have made Locked On Boston College your first listen. We're the only daily Boston College podcast on in the world right now. There's some that do it daily, you know, weekly, some that do it monthly. We give you Boston College news every single day with analysis, guests, interviews, everything that you want all here on our show. So thank you all. And if this is your first time listening, I want to welcome you. I hope you become one of our next daily listeners. So we have with us Mitch Wolf. Mitch does a whole bunch of different things, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, But he's also a writer for BC Bulletin. And we're talking about Pro Day. And it was an exciting moment on campus. Uh, You know, the, the, the coaching staff gets really excited about the players do too, because this is their chance to take that next step. For many of these players, these are the dreams that they've had. They want to go to the pros, and this is their chance to show off and to try to prove their case that maybe they're not a fringy player, that they're a player that they, they, you could take a risk on in draft. Now, the defensive side of the ball, there was a couple of players I thought of when I, you know, when we're talking about possibly getting drafted, but I want to hear Mitch's thoughts. Who who stood out to you? And was there anything that you noticed? And did IGM? Did Isaiah Graham Mobley, did he work out? Uh, so he stood on most of his numbers from the combine, uh, namely his 40. He did the jumps again. Uh, he improved his vertical by, I want to say, two or two and a half inches. His broad jump went down by two inches, but they'll usually just take the best number you have. Uh, he had a 4.4 short shuttle, which I don't think he did at the combine, so that's good. Uh, had a 24 rep bench press, which I think was the best of everybody, so that's good to see um, for a linebacker who's only 229 pounds. So um, I thought he had a decent day. You know, he didn't, I, I, in terms of the athletic testing, he did some of that at the combine, like we said, and, you know, he was talking on the broadcast and he was, they asked him, you know, where are you hearing about where you'll get drafted? And he said, Oh, I'm hearing late day two, early day three, which is, you know, third and fourth rounds. And I was pretty surprised to hear that because, you know, regardless of his play on the field, he's had a lot of injury issues. And when he's been on the field, he's been pretty good, but not, you know, he's in a, he's a relatively undersized linebacker and he's not, super duper athletic he's a decent athlete. he's a good athlete but not incredible um so that was a bit surprising to me i'm not sure exactly who he's talking to but you know if that happens good for him um the surprise of the day for me that was brandon barlow who had i would say probably the best day of anybody at the pro day um he came in at six six four flat 256 pounds nearly 10 inch arms an 81 inch wingspan as 40 was around 4.8, you know, there's a little bit of wiggle room there, but that's pretty good for a defensive end of his size Had 23 reps on the bench, which is good. Uh, and then a 4.37 short shuttle, which is great. 35 inch vertical, fantastic. And then a nine foot, seven inch broad jump, which the jumps, you kind of just think, okay, well, like, you know, aside from the vertical, like, what does that mean? You know, obviously you can jump high, that's cool and all, but what does it really mean? And what those drills measure is your, the strength of your legs and how, explosive you are um from different stances and for defensive ends that's really important because it displays you know how explosive are you from your stance and how good is your get off and your burst when you're rushing the passer or just you know getting off the snap and with barlow you know he didn't he's never had a great pass rushing season i think he only has four career sacks so in today's nfl when teams are looking for as much pass rush help as they can get i'm not sure how valuable he's going to be you know relative to a guy like max roberts who was the pro day again um, who was kind of a pass rush extraordinary, you know, he latched onto the Rams as a camp guy, but then didn't work out. And with Barlow, you know, like I said, like his pass rush skills aren't necessarily there, but he's got the good athletic ability. He's a really good run defender. So, you know, maybe he makes it on special teams as a practice squad guy as well. But, you know, the pro, the pro day is important for these kind of guys who are on the fringe, because if you can have a big day, showcase that you're a plus athlete that belongs to the NFL just based on athletic ability, you'll you'll show NFL coaches and scouts like, hey, I got to go back to the film, you know, check this guy out. And maybe that extra look gets you your shot at making an NFL roster. Yeah, it's interesting with Barlow. Yeah, as you said, like he's he had his moments with the with BC, but it was always kind of inconsistent. He never was. And you, you'd, you'd be no better with snap counts. I just never saw him as a consistent player with BC he's always seemed like to be the third defensive end out there for BC for the Eagles. Um, but for those of you folks that didn't understand, like if you, if you're not aware of it, so someone like Max Roberts that showed up, obviously he went through the draft process last year. It was just an opportunity for him to show up 
and show scouts again. For instance, and this can they can do this for years too. I just saw that Oregon's going to have DeAnthony Thomas there, who graduated. Oh man. Well, how many he years was, ago? But yeah, but he was so good. He was one of my favorite players to use in NCAA 14 just because he was so freaking fast. <laughs> yeah. And he, um, I was reading the article. He took 2020 off because of COVID and oh, then yeah. played in the CFL last year, but wants to get back in the NFL. So he's going to show up to their pro day mm-hmm. and, and work out for the staff, for the uh, scouts. So we, BC's mm-hmm. done this in year for years. They had Ben Glines there last year after he had graduated. Medi- they had Mediala track the other yep. year. I think he came back as well. Yeah. <laughs> so this is not an uncommon thing. So, Mitch, are you getting excited for draft time? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is my Christmas. Like, you know, it's a still have about a month, um, but, you know, I'm working through different position groups. Like I've been saying, like I've been going through my BC guys, um, you know, getting those scouting reports done, um, moving some dudes around in my rankings and stuff, just doing some final checks of positions. But, yeah, I mean, this is my best time of the year, honestly. Yeah. So speaking of um, guys getting excited, we're going to Mitch and I are going to add a new feature, especially now that the season's over um, it, for many of you out there that have Twitter, you know, who new coach uh, offensive line coach is Dave Guglielmo. He's become one of the most uh, fascinating followers on Twitter. I Mitch and I tweet back everything he tweets because it's, it's almost absurd the, and not in a negative way. I'm just saying like, it's absurd what he tweets, but it's amazing. It's funny. It's, um, just like, I don't know. He's found his own little niche. I think he just started Twitter when he got to BC too. So he's just like, he's on it all the time, which I'm like, how do you have time to coach? But that's not for me to say, I'm sure he probably, from what I've heard, he's doing a great job there too. So each week we're going to do something called our top dog of the week. And if you follow Googs, uh, coach Goog, that's what he goes by on Twitter. Um, he does his big dogs. Everything is a big dog. Literally he has a talent for linking everything to being a big dog. Uh, that's what his word is for finding recruits out there. That's what he wants his linemen to be for the offensive line. It's hashtag big dog, all in cap letters every single time. And he does it and he connects it to memes on Twitter, pictures, videos, So our top dog of the week is not a player that played really well. It's not a recruit that they bring in. It's one of his tweets. We're going to find one that we find the best. And they're usually the memes. So we'll explain what they are. We'll, we'll just Mitch and I each picked a different one. This is uh, this is what we call great radio. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Well, we'll tweet out on locked on BC tomorrow morning, the, the two tweets. So you could pick which one you like better. Um, but we'll read you his tweets and then you can decide which is, which is the real top dog of the week. Mitch, you want to go first? Yeah. So mine is from uh, March 24th and this is at 5 49 PM. So I imagine this is, um, I imagine Googe has just finished putting down a massive plate of spaghetti and meatballs and is just scrolling Twitter, uh, trying to find some new big dogs. So the video is from amazing nature and it's just a very large elephant that has a, uh, branch in its tree and it says that this elephant is over 8,000 kilograms so the tweet goes as follows at almost 18,000 pounds this is the hashtag big dog of pachyderms this guy is so big he has vegetation growing on his tusk like his own personal portable garden rumor has it he has no eligibility remaining (laughs) okay which and and the part of the reason why these tweets are so great is because i think they are done just completely in earnest like it's like he is literally like man it's a shame this elephant has no eligibility left also anytime you can work the the word pachyderm into a sentence i really respect that so that's why this is my hashtag big dog tweet of the week okay so that's mitch's mine came in at 6 35 a.m on uh, march 26 on friday which i imagine coach coach googs came up and just mainlined um black coffee for about an hour when he put this tweet up it's a video from uh the twitter attached um handle unexpected scenes which is like they're kind of like whoa what's that and it's a dog seemingly riding a motorcycle I don't know why or moped with two people behind him. And so here he goes. This is what coach Googs tweeted. Just another hat. Oh, so just another hashtag big dog spotted doing the seemingly impossible common theme over and over and over and over again. The only limits to a hashtag big dogs accomplishments are those set by the individual hashtag big dog. So set them high hashtag dog. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, I, I love my my favorite thing is that he had in that tweet three hashtag big dogs 
hashtag dog for I don't know. I don't know why that needs to be hashtag, but it, it just incorporates his personality so well. Uh, that is, and I just imagine him watching that dog going, that's the kind of offensive lineman I need at BC. And I have no idea what that would even mean, but that's what he wants. So those I'm are also our- just, I'm also just excited for when he, we get all of the nicknames that he's going to give all the offensive linemen, because I know that I think Jack Conley's cannoli. Yep. And I, I think Kendall has one, but I, I can't remember what it is. Um, but I know that they're working, but he's working on them. So I, I'm, I hope that um, whoever the new SID is like puts these in the program or like for the media guide where they have, you know, all the players names and they have like um, Jack Cannoli Con- Conley in the mm-hmm. program, because I think we have to kind of adopt these nicknames as canon for the players. And, and I like to say too, I have reached out to BC in the past couple of years. I was trying to get Halfley on last year. His schedule just didn't end up working out. Halfley has to go down my list now. I want Guglielmo <laughs> on my show so badly because I, I mean, literally, I have a million questions I have for him. And they're, they, they, are, they range from like NFL stuff to this whole social media thing. I just want to know him more. Like, I don't even care. Like, Halfley would be great to be on because it's just Jeff Halfley and he's a, great, he's a great guy to talk to. But Googs, man, put him way up there for me. Yeah, I just want to know, like, because at some point, you know, the big dog had to come to him just as the <laughs> idea. And that's how, like, I just want to know, like, what were, were there other candidates? Like, what were the other, you know, ideas or bits in the running that, you know, eventually went lost to big dog? But yeah, that I definitely I can't wait to have him on the show, ideally. Let, let, I need to see his storyboard. What did he have? Like, where did he go with that? Um, it's like and- he's got he's got like the Pepe Silvia from It's Always Sunny, where he's got yeah. all the the yarn on the board, and he's just like trying to think of a name. And at the end, is a national championship with like yeah. yarn going. <laughs> anyway, so this is uh, locked on Boston College. We're a, a fun podcast. Um, anyways, and the, my last thought before we let you go, Mitch, was uh, it seems to be rubbing off on players. I saw Christian Mahogany starting to tweet out big dog stuff. Mm-hmm. And so maybe we'll see all of their offensive linemen doing this for the next couple months. But anyways, where can people find you on social media? You can find me at Mitchell T Wolf, W O L F E. Um, mostly just tweet. I'm trying to tweet out some clips of plays of players in there uh, during this draft process. Um, I'll be tweeting out my reports for the BC players, along with uh, ideally some of my uh, reports and other players, my positional rankings for the upcoming NFL draft. Uh, so just make sure you're following me there. All right. In a moment, we're going to go into the news, including baseball getting swept again. We'll get into basketball with a portal player, a uh, player entering the portal and one I am looking into, but I haven't heard officially yet and a whole lot more. Be sure to check us out in just a moment. Now it's that time of the year again, and I've pretty much given up on all my New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm sticking to my resolution to eat right thanks to Built Bar. It almost feels like it's not really a resolution because I enjoy eating them. Have you tried the Puffs yet? If you haven't tried the Puff, you're missing out on one of Built Bar's best tasting tasting, uh, features. Puffs puffs are the first ever protein-infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, they're marshmallow, and they are so good. They're 100% covered in chocolate, just like the Built Bar. They're low-calorie, high-protein, and you can replace your candy bars with these because they are better. I'm telling you, my son is three years old, and I had him have a couple bites of my Built Bar. He loves them. He always asks me for them. I I don't usually give them because I want them for myself, but I'm telling you, everyone in my family, they love the Built Bars. There's some great flavors you can check out, including mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, and new for this month, white chocolate cookies and cream. They're all delicious, and new flavors are coming out all the time. If you think their flavor might be good, they'll make it. It'll be delicious, and it'll be good for you. So head on over to Built.com and use promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your order. Again, use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. This is Locked On Boston College. AJ Black here. This is our little news segment where we just kind of go over some of the news items that didn't really make the cut for our two segments that we did before this and just give you some of the details of things that have been happening on campus so that you're up to date on things happening with Boston College. We'll start off with basketball. As the transfer portal has been blowing up across the nation, as over last time I checked, 900 players have entered the transfer portal. And Boston College, as we had said earlier, has not been immune to it as they've had two players enter the transfer portal. Early last week, Kanye Jones, a true freshman, entered the portal. I mean, he was a guy that averaged about two points a game. Not really a huge loss there. And, you know, wish him the best and hope he finds a program that will fit his needs. Later the week, this week, Justin Vanderbon, a center from uh, Northbridge, Massachusetts. He played in um, 
For the Eagles, he was like uh, he was a sophomore this year. He entered the transfer portal as well. Again, makes a lot of sense. He was the third string center. He only played in a couple of games when there was injuries, when Quinton Post was out with COVID, and there was foul trouble in a game against Pitt. Um, again, I don't think he's a huge loss. You know, he's an end of the bench kind of guy. Uh, he, you know, he had a lot of mid-major interest when he first came out. He's seven feet tall. He's a big dude. You can't teach that. Um, but we'll see where he ends up. It gives BC a uh, transfer portal slot to go out and grab a player that fits what they want. I think it'll probably be a big now that they lost him. I think it'll be someone uh, that maybe fits the mold of what Grant wants, which is more defense. I think, you know, Vanderbond. When he got in there, he was just a foul machine, basically. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he, he really couldn't do a, a whole lot on defense, even as a seven-foot guy. He was kind of a – I mean, you've seen pictures of him. He's a, he's kind of a real thin guy. He tried hard, but I don't think he was a good fit for BC. Now, there's a little bit of competing information out there, and I'm not saying either of these are right. But uh, I saw that Tyler Calvaruso tweeted out that – Gianni Thompson has entered the transfer portal. If you listen to this podcast, I've predicted he's going to enter the transfer portal. I just want to say right now, I haven't gotten confirmation yet that he is. And Tyler may have a source that has. I I talked to BC. I, I've, I've reached out to different sources that I know, and I haven't heard anything in conf- confirming it yet. So uh, he probably will. I just Maybe he's doing something to do it behind the scenes. But I just want to say it right now. I have not heard confirmation of him, but he would be the third uh, transfer portal player. Now that gives BC probably two transfer portal spots heading into next season, because if the buzz is true around uh, Makai Ashton Langford returning, which I've heard a lot that that's going to happen, he's going to need a spot. So that'll take one of those away. Cause if he was to come back and you had no transfer portal spots, uh, they'd be over the uh, scholarship limit. So he's got to need a spot. So there's one. They'll have two. Uh, so they've been linked to a whole bunch of different recruits. Well, uh, it, it's kind of been quiet recently. I saw a couple names early last year, uh, last season. Uh, sorry, last week. My goodness. Uh, but nothing really uh, substantial as, as of yet. So that's basketball. That kind of wraps that up. Then we'll uh, mention that baseball. I said earlier, uh, I mean, what is what? I mean, I, if you're following this, you either probably have friends on the team or know somebody on the team or your family members. A tough watch this team is. They have a ten. They, I mean, last game they just lost. They lost by over 15 runs. They got beaten extra innings on Saturday and then got smoked on Friday. Um, you know, it's Louisville. They're the only team in the ACC that hasn't lost an ACC game yet. But I mean, it's just the it's over and over again. The The pitching staff has an ERA well over eight right now. The hitting isn't there. They're just, I mean, Mike, Mike Gambino, the head coach said, uh, the results aren't there, but the development is coming. I mean, what, what, like the pitching isn't there. The, the, you, you're getting like, I mean, maybe he's seeing it, but I, I, I've watched and seen some of the results. To me, it looks like you see some spotty development here. Like you'll see a good pitching start. For a couple innings, and then the bullpen just implodes, or they fall, and it seems like every game, it's like they they are in it or they're leading, and then it just falls apart. So there's those moments, but those are so far and far few and far between, and close doesn't count unless you're in hand grenades and ho- or playing horseshoes, it right. So like I don't want to hear it. Like just win games, man, and I don't see it happening. I don't, they, their pitching staff is very inconsistent. They they've had better starts here and there. But they're not going to win many ACC games. They're one and eight in the ACC right now. So baseball is it's just a tough out. Uh, now um, women's lacrosse they won this weekend. They beat Pitt, so they're back on the right track after losing to UNC in a great game last week. Uh, great to see that. And uh, that's where we're going to leave it off. We'll talk more tomorrow about everything going on. Uh, we'll have more news hopefully about the transfer portal. We'll have some spring football updates that you're going to want to know about. If you have anything you want us to talk about, other than if it's like you want me to get into like a sport that I don't know much about, I'll tell you if that happens. But I'd love to hear about it. Shoot it, shoot it to me on Twitter at, at AJBlack underscore BC or at LockedOnBC also. Um, thank you all for listening, and we'll see you all again shortly. Take care, everyone.